Good morning, church family. Thank you for joining us this day for this time of worship. Those of you who are here in the sanctuary and those of you who are joining us online and those of you who are listening in through Zoom, we appreciate and certainly welcome you to this time of worship. Uh, Friends, you've had an opportunity both online here in the sanctuary to view our announcements that were on the screen ahead of time. Uh, If you didn't have a chance to review those, those will be displayed again at the end of service this day. And so, friends, we prepare ourselves to move forward this day into our time of worship. Our opening hymn, I Am Thine, O Lord, number 419 in the hymnal, I Am Thine, O Lord, number 419 in the hymnal, verses 1 through 3, or you can find those lyrics also on our monitor as well. I Am Thine, O Lord, verses 1 through 3, number 419 in the hymnal for those of you who are here in the sanctuary or on the monitor and those of you who are joining us at home on your screen. I Am Thine, O Lord.
Please join me in our opening prayer. Almighty and loving God, we have gathered to worship and praise your holy name. Help us. And worship passionately. We want to be a faithful and transformative community of faith. Remove all stumbling blocks that would hinder or distract us from accomplishing the mission, vision you have given to us. Bring unto us the people who will have me to become thee. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from Luke, chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Then they arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus... He fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him, he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wild. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons have entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine were feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter them. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the men and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herders saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done to you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The word of God for the people of God.
I don't know. I have to keep following that. That's kind of a large order. So our most important lesson. God loves me all the time. God loves me all the time. So this morning, I, I was thinking about God as and Jesus as the time changes and the light changes. So, well, I can make it work. So the, I've been out in the mornings early when it's still dark and seeing how many of you students have to ride a bus. Anybody have to ride a bus? Well, there are a lot of people who do. And I find students with lights, either from their phones or carrying flashlights, because it's dark in the morning. And the buses have lights. And, and so the light helps them to be safe, although it feels a little tenuous to me. So I thought today about thinking about Jesus as light in the world. The lights, the little lights, the big lights, the lights that shine in the dark, that that is God through Jesus making a path. God is our light. And especially this time of year when we experience so much darkness, I thought perhaps it would be helpful to think about God in every little light we see to shine, that we might indeed be safe, that we might know God even in the darkest moments of the year, that that light is for us, is Jesus being light for us and Christ in the world. Let's pray. Gracious God, I give you thanks for every single light that you shine in our world. Help, help us to follow those lights you send to guide us. Be with us, even as we enter into this longest, darkest part of the year. Guide us to you in safety and goodness, in the love of your embrace. Amen. And now, this very special moment of recognition. Friends, today is All Saints Sunday, and All Saints Sunday is an opportunity for us to take time to honor and to remember those who have shaped us into the people that we are today. And so we pause for a time of somber remembrance for those that we love but we see no more. So this day, we remember Olive Lush, Helen Curry, William Smith, Jeremy Cook, Stan Hansen, Sally Mattmuller, Roland Roberts, Carolyn Leeson, Dolores Fox, Jim Parampel, Thomas Bridgeford, Carol Karak, Louise Seppin, 
Patricia Singleton, Cole Ruder, Reverend Tom Tarpley, Reverend Dr. Wesley Brunn. These were the names that have been submitted, but recognizing that there may be other names amongst us this day, uh, Doug has a microphone for other names to be lifted. Uh, if you would simply lift the hand so that we might be able to locate you quickly. Pam Trimpey. Carol Tenenfeld. Doug Muller and Robert Cook. Sue Kennedy, Marcy Kennedy, Ron Spencer. My great aunt, Joanne Schatz, who lived to be 100 years old. Let's pray. Oh, we have another. My father, Robert Vincent. Let's pray. God of hope, grace, and peace, we thank you for those we've loved who now rest with you. Grant us your comforting presence in our moments of loneliness and sadness. Heal us of the pain and longing that keeps us stifled in despair. Help us to embrace our cherished memories and the joy that birthed within our heart. Help us to grieve as those who have an enduring hope and calm assurance that you are with us. Encourage our souls and mend our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, now we turn our attention to that wonderful hymn of the church as we move into the season of transition from this time of remembrance until this time of preparation for the word this day. Our hymn this day will understand it better by and by. We'll understand it better by and by. Number 525 five in the hymnal, verses 1 through 3. We'll understand it better by and by, verses 1 through 3. Number 525 in the hymnal on the screens in front of you for those of you who are joining us virtually. We'll understand it better by and by.
Thank you, Harvey, for always offering us wonderful music to buffet and bracket this time of worship and commune with God. Friends, our theme for today's message is dwelling with the dead. Dwelling with the dead. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask your blessing upon us as we move forward into this time of impartation where you can impart to us. Speak to us your word of equipping and encouragement to inspire and to convict, to encourage and to direct, that we might be the best ambassadors, the best beacons of hope for the world, that the light of Christ that burns in us might awaken in others the hope within. We now decrease and ask that you would increase, that every word that is uttered, every revelation that is given, will give glory to you. This we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, and all God's people together said, Amen. And so, friends, on this All Saints Day, it seems an odd question to pose, are we dwelling with the dead? For it seems on this day and this Sunday in particular that these are the times where we remember those who have made their transition to the chorus triumphant. But the theme for our message today is not the remembrance of those who have helped shape us into the people that we are today. The theme of our message this day asks us the question, are we dwelling with the dead, not those who have passed on, but those who are still living, yet not living to the fullest? I'm referring to, indeed, those moments and those opportunities where we miss the divine invitation to engage, to offer, to extend ourselves in ways that transform and help others to see Christ in themselves and for us to move forward into this mission field to offer grace and hope for others, that we find ourselves stagnant and apathetic towards what God is pushing us towards in order to maintain a status quo that allows us to indeed be irrelevant, complacent, and comfortable. Indeed, friends, when we look at our text this day, I am thankful for the great way that text speaks to us time and time again. You'll notice this is the same text that we had from last week, and what you'll hear this day is a difference in what we're looking at and focusing for our time this day. That's the great gift of Scripture. As many times as you read it, God can show you something different each and every time. And so for us, we have this moment of recap that Jesus comes to the land of the Gerasenes, gets out of the boat, sets foot in the land of the Gerasenes, and he is met by someone who is possessed with demons. He does not have a name. And so uh, in thinking of a name for him, I had to be careful because I know that there are many folks here. And so we're going to call him Mark. Is there, there, is there a Mark today? No Mark? Awesome. We'll call him Mark. And so Mark meets Jesus as he sets foot into the land of the Gerasenes. And the demons within him recognize the power and the potential that Jesus has. And so they say to Jesus, do not cast us away. We recognize who you are. And so before anyone else could tell you who we are, before anyone else could point you in our direction, we decided to meet you here in order to plead our case that we might survive. The text tells us that Jesus has the conversation with these demons. He says, and what is your name? And they say that our name is? I was hoping I had some Bible readers, at least who would remember. Our name is Legion, for there are many of us here. And Jesus says, what would you have me do? He says, well, we, we don't want you to cast us into the abyss where we will be gone forever. Allow us instead to go into that herd of pigs that is grazing over there so that we might survive. Now, I know some of you are very astute and you've recognized that, wait a minute, didn't the pigs go off the cliff? So how did they survive? Very good question. Because here's what you have to understand about the legion of demons that is possessing Mark. Their purpose, their intent is to cause despair, hardship, and to break them. And so they go into this herd of pigs, turn those pigs so insane that they go right off the cliff. Now, who did that hurt? Did it hurt the demons? No. It hurts the one who owns the herd. Notice in the text, those who were the pig's herdsmen immediately go and tell 
everyone what happened. Why? Because, like most of us, if there's a mistake on the job, I need, to less, I need to fill out a report, an incident report, to make sure that everyone understands exactly what happened. It was not my fault here, is what happened. We were grazing the herd, and all of a sudden we heard this conversation with Mark. Y'all, everybody knows Mark. Mark and this new man on the shore, and they were having this conversation about what to do, and then all of a sudden these pigs went crazy and went right off the cliff. We didn't do anything. Think about what the demons did to the herd. And an incident in a moment forces them to go over a cliff. How much more were they tormenting Mark? The text tells us that from time to time they would seize him, have him convulse, throw him into fire, so much so that the people of the Gerasenes would chain him and bind him, but he would break his chains. They would cast him out and he would move out from the city into the cemetery to dwell, so tormented by the voices inside of his head. Now, those of us who work in the mental health field understand that this is probably some form of bipolar schizophrenia or a personality disorder that we could probably recognize and treat today, but in ancient antiquity, everything that was an abnormality was called demon possession. And so Mark had been tormented by these voices and these impulses to the point that now he finds himself in front of Jesus, not speaking for himself, but the demons speaking on their behalf. And in that moment, the demons leave him, possess the pigs, they go over the herd, but now Mark has something he's never had before. Silence inside his head. One of the things that I've learned working in community mental health is the frightening reality of being trapped inside your own mind. To arguing with yourself, and not just the usual things, the conversations that we would normally have with ourselves, like we do in there every morning. Like, I gotta remember to take my medicines. Did I take my medicines? Did I brush my teeth? I brush my teeth. I did, did I have my cup of coffee? I have not had my cup of coffee. And before I leave out, I'm gonna look in the mirror to make sure everything's presentable so that I'm making sure that I'm wearing clothes that are presentable. N not that kind of conversation, but to have the kind of conversations that leave us to be tormented. Mark, for the first time, has silence in his mind. And those herdsmen go off into the city and they tell their owner and they tell everyone else, it was not our fault. This man on the outside of our city did something that caused this great commotion. And what happens in this scene that's supposed to be a triumph, that's supposed to be a time of rejoicing, we find out that Mark is dwelling with the dead, but the dead aren't in the cemetery, they're in the city. Because what happens when the people come and see Mark sitting at the feet of Jesus? The text tells us clothed in his right mind for the first time in a long time, sitting there listening to the message of hope and redemption, sitting there helping and receiving all this great giftingness that God has to offer him. And they see him and the text tells us that they don't rejoice, but they are seized with fear. They are seized with fear, so much so that they ask Jesus to leave. Think of that for a moment. Why would people be so afraid that they ask Jesus to leave? I submit to you, friends, that when they saw Mark, they saw a possibility that frightened them, that if Jesus could do this for Mark, the scapegoat, the one that we blame for everything, the one that we targeted and said, as long as I'm not like Mark, I'm still good. I might have my own issues. I might have some things going on, but I'm not like Mark. Mark is well. Mark is clothed in his right mind. And now I can't point to Mark as my scapegoat. I can't point to Mark and say it's, it's all Mark's fault. We, we recognize that some folks have black sheep in the family, as we like to call them. And that black sheep of the family is the brunt of all of the family's angst and anxiety. And those of us who have studied family dynamics understand that often they put on one person in the family all of the angst and anxiety so that they don't have to deal with it themselves. 
Mark has been the scapegoat for this whole city. And when they see Mark healed and delivered, they are afraid of what Jesus will now do for them. Isn't that amazing? So bought into the idea of being dead that life and resurrection is frightening. Well, friends, we see that even in our modern context, that there are some folks who are so bought into their woundedness and their pain that they're not trying to get healed. They remind us all the time, it's, I'm not, it's, this is not my fault. I'm, I'm just this way because, and we accept it. We allow for it. We, we say, well, you know, you, you have to understand that's just how maiden is. That, that's how she acts. And, and we provide buffers for those kinds of behaviors as opposed to challenging them to say, why don't you get healed? It's the same as when we have our friend, many of us have a friend or somebody who has an illness. And every time we talk to them, they're talking about, oh, I don't feel well today. This diabetes, this arthritis is getting on my last nerve. And we ask them the question, have you done what the doctor told you to do? And their response is, oh, those doctors don't know what they told me to do. I, I'm not going to change my diet. I'm, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die happy. Wait a minute. You have an opportunity to be healed and delivered. You have an opportunity to change the way that you're living and it's going to require you to make some sacrifices, but you can have a better life, but you're so committed to living in dead things that you would rather be in pain than to be healed. The people from the city see Mark and are afraid of what God can do for them. They find themselves among the dead set. You know those dead set folks. Dead set on doing everything possible not to change. Dead set on continuing things the way they were. Dead set on reminding you of every mistake that you've made, even though you've well been past that. Dead set on doing the things and finding fault in every opportunity that you have so that you won't be able to progress, so that it won't force them to look at their own life's decisions. Dead set on keeping the family drama going. Each and every time you gather, and we're getting ready to gather for a big family opportunity, that's one person that everyone says, are they coming to dinner? Because they're dead set on reliving the past as opposed to moving forward into the future. Dead set on continuing to be who they used to be and not embrace the opportunity of who they can become. Dead set on resisting any kind of change in order to maintain their status quo. Dead set on dwelling with the dead, even if it means inviting Jesus to leave. Now, note what the text says. It says Jesus is invited to leave. He gets into the boat and it says he could do no miracles there because the people didn't want to receive transformation. They didn't want to receive change. They were comfortable living the way they were. They already now had to deal with Mark and they were hoping that Mark would go with Jesus. Why? Because if Mark wasn't around, they wouldn't have to be reminded of the fact that they had healing in front of them, but invited it to leave. Mark begs to go with Jesus and Jesus says to him, no, I need you to now go and tell everyone you meet what has happened for you. So that they will ask themselves the question and start asking the question, well, what else did Jesus do? And you will have the testimony. He couldn't do nothing because we invited him to leave. He could have done wonderful, miraculous things, but we were so afraid of what that would do, the change and transformation that would be needed, what it would cause us to have to give up that we invite him to leave. But I'm here as a reminder of what great things God can do. Because everybody knew who Mark was. Because Mark was the one that was the scapegoat. But now Mark is the beacon of transformation and hope. Indeed, friends, God can do any and all things for us 
And sometimes the folks around us are afraid of what happens when they see us coming. Not because we're wonderful and great, but because we represent transformation and a question of why haven't you done something with your life? So sometimes we have family and friends that shun us and distance, from us, distance themselves from us because they don't want the tangible example of what God can do with a willing heart. Because if Jesus can change us with all our baggage, and we got some baggage, if God can do it for us, and those who know us know about it, there's no longer an excuse for them. I've said this frequently before, and I'm coming to a close. The, one of the greatest compliments I received, I have to understand in retrospect, was when I ran into some of my high school classmates, and that's the, the great blessing and the great challenge of coming back to the city you grew up in, is you run into people who knew you when. And when they ask me, what are you doing? And I tell them, There's the question mark that comes upon their face that says, you're a preacher? <laughs> Say, yes. Do the people know? <laughs> yes. Because I tell my dirt stories. Because that's who I used to be, not who I am. And so when I tell people I used to curse like a sailor, they say, I, I, I just can't see, I can't see that on you, Rev. I, 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 I can envision possibly, but, but I can't see you cussing every third word as if it was easy. I can't see you being someone that was vengeful and would plot and plan on somebody for a year to get vengeance. Oh, we hit a nerve. Okay, now we're going to come off of that one. And that's because I met Jesus at the shore, who transformed and changed. And that's the great gift. So when, when I run into those classmates and tell them what I, I'm doing now, and they look at me with that question mark, and I offer them the invitation, hey, you want to come and check out what we're doing? Some of them want to come and see it just to see. <laughs> I got to see this for myself. <laughs> And others say, no, that's okay. I'd rather remember you for who you used to be than experience who you are now. Friends, each and every one of us has a divine assignment that God seeks to partner with us to transform the lives of those around us. Yet to fulfill that assignment will require us to step out of our dead places in order to embrace new possibilities. We will have to challenge ourselves to continue to learn and grow in our relationship with God to resist the dead set tendencies, the romanticized versions of our past to mark our experiences with transformation and wholeness because indeed God wants that for our lives. God offers us healing and transformation to change us for the better that we move from dwelling with the dead to living life abundant. Mark's life forever changed because he met a man named Jesus. And the people of Genesis were forever the same because they told Jesus to leave. I'm a witness. I'd rather meet Jesus, go through the change and the transformation, and it does hurt than to stick into the dead life that I had before. Jesus wants to give us life and life abundantly so that each and every one of us can experience newness. This is the word of God, friends. The opportunity for relationship that your life might be changed and more so than that, that the lives of those around you might be changed as well. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
It's time for the offering. We appreciate your continu continued prayerfulness and financial support of the church. For those in the sanctuary, please remember to place your offering in the offering box as you exit. For those viewing online or listening, we you may drop in, you may mail or drop off a contribution to our address 33112 Grand River, Farmington, Michigan 48336. You may use PayPal and direct your contribution to First United Methodist Church of Farmington, or you may text to give by texting FUMCGIVE to 44321 and follow the prompts. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, you have given us riches beyond measure. We can return only a fraction of what we owe you. But we ask, Lord, that you will bless our offerings and help us to use them wisely in your service and for your glory. Amen. Friends, we've now come to the opportunity for us to gather for times of prayer, reminding ourselves of the great celebrations and at the same time reminding ourselves of those who are in need of our prayers. We are continuing to pray for all of our healthcare workers, for Matthew and Nicholas Walters and for William Mortison. We're thankful for the continued healing of Ken Berry and Pat Shuffler, Patty Morrison and Paul King, Braden and Nina Smith, and we ask God's blessing of healing for Anne St. John, for Sandy Roth, for Andrea Schrader, for Reverend Sharon Scott, for Carmel Houston, Opal Sherman, 
John Welch, Otto Mildred and Edna Tyson, for Harry Ellis and the Reverend Nancy Frank, along with Elizabeth Bartram, Sue Jackson, Terry Shuffler, Brian Lim, and Alexander Frazier. We lift up those who are continuing to battle with COVID, including the Reverend Tom Waller and family, along with members of the Lawson family. And we lift up those who are battling with forms of cancer, in particular Silas Trupiano, Aidan McLaren, Danielle Maj, Jerry Baum, Sam, Bill, and March Johnston, Dottie Bradley, Thomas Lee, Raina Edwards, and her grandfather. And on this day, as we remember those who have meant so much to us, we also lift those who are in states and seasons of sorrow and grief, in particular the families of General Colin Powell, Nadine Moses, the Reverend Tom Tarpley, Leon Jefferson, George Zonte Crane, the families of Pastor Nath and Che, along with all those who grieve as a result of tragic means. I offer you now, friends, a moment of silent prayer for those names and situations that were lifted and those that are on your hearts and minds, a moment of silent prayer. Speaks to our hearts, Holy Spirit, and give us that word of hope and affirmation that brings new life in the midst of despair and darkness. Speak, Holy Spirit, for we, your servants, are listening, not simply for those things that we have brought to you this day, but that we might hear from you your word of instruction, that we might be a blessing to those around us, that we might be the answers to prayer for those who have earnestly sought you. Come now, O oh God, continue to transform us, melt and mold us, shape and refine us into vessels fitting for your spirit, that we might pour it into the lives of others. Come now, O oh God, continue to work within us, that we might move forward from this place out into the world to share your grace, your love, and your compassion, your forgiveness, and your mercy with others, that we do the very best we can to be a beacon of transformation and hope genuinely and authentically serving you to the best of our ability, recognizing you have not called us to be perfect, you've called us to be consistent. So let us strive each day to get better than we were the day before. As now we lift up those who are in need of your healing touch, those who are in hospitals and homes and rehabilitation facilities, allow the pain to cease that they might give you glory. For those who find themselves gripped by sorrow, allow us to be your hands and feet of comfort and compassion that they know that they are not alone and continue to move within us to be ambassadors of peace and hope amidst confusion and despair. As now we join our voices in the model prayer that Jesus offers to us, our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we now prepare ourselves to move forward into this time of holy communion where we are able to come to the table as humbly as we know how, receiving these gifts of wholeness and forgiveness, that as we depart from the table, we go forth to offer those gifts to others as well. Let's prepare our hearts to move forward into this time of Holy Communion.
Friends, we gather now for this time of Holy Communion, recognizing God's gift offered to us. As United Methodists, we believe in what's called the open table, which simply means that all who are seeking to be in right relationship with God, who earnestly repent of their sins and seek at this moment and at this time to commune with God yet again, are invited to come to the table. Regardless of how many times you've been to church, if you've not been to church, regardless of what denominational affiliation you might have at this moment, at this time, you seek right relationship with God, you are invited to come. And so we move our attention now to that great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right always and everywhere to give our thanks and praise to the God that continues to offer us hope and inspiration, that looks at us wallowing in the misery of our own sinfulness, lifts us up and offers us peace that surpasses all understanding. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And on the night in which he was to give himself over into the hands of wicked persons, he gathered disciples in the upper room, eager to celebrate the remembrance of Passover, but also eager to institute this great gift of wholeness and healing. And as he looked around the table into each face, he recognized who would betray him who would deny him, who would not pick up the cross and follow, yet he offers these gifts. So he takes bread, gives thanks to God and breaks it, giving it to the disciples saying, take, eat all of you. This is my body, which is being offered for you, that you might be made whole in mind, body, and in spirit. Take, eat all of you, do this in remembrance of me. After which he took the cup and when he had given thanks to God, he gave it to the disciples saying, take, drink all of you. This is the cup of sacrifice for the establishment of a new covenant, for the forgiveness of sins that you might also forgive others who sinned against you. Take, drink, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Friends, we prepare ourselves to receive this day these gifts of wholeness and forgiveness. The body of Christ offered for us that we might be made whole. A cup of sacrifice, establishing a new covenant, forgiving us of every wrong choice, poor decision, that we might also forgive others as well. body of Christ, friends, take and eat. The cup of sacrifice, take and drink. Friends, as you rise and go from this place, I will remind you of the grace and love God has offered for you, that you might go forth into the world and share it openly with others, that the healing and forgiveness that we have received, we offer to others as well. For you are a blessing from God. Now go and be a blessing. Have a great day. Have a great week. Amen.